No, skepticism is awesome. There it's you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Welcome, everyone, to the Skepticism and Humanities panel. I'm delighted to see such a large turnout. Um, I'm Bob Blaskowitz. I'm a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Writing and Communication program at the Georgia Institute of Technology, uh, where I teach you know, uh, writing and argument classes. Um, and they generally take extraordinary claims as their topic. Um, my dissertation was on, on uh, the fiction and memoirs of World War II combat veterans. Uh, two years ago, at my first Dragon Con, I was struck by something that uh, Eugenie Scott said during a Q&A session. She said that critical thinking makes you a better theologian. And she wasn't speaking ironically. Uh, when talking to self-identifying skeptics, I have the impression uh, that many of them think that science is the ultimate concern of skepticism. Um, I haven't gone through the credentials of all the presenters here at Dragon Con in the skeptic track, but I'm willing to bet that they're uh, weighted rather heavily against the uh, you know, general population in terms of professional scientists and science enthusiasts. Um, I did go through the, the list of the people who will be speaking at SciCon, and that's absolutely the case. Um, in a way, this is a, just a, a, another round in the, the long-standing two cultures debate, um, which got its name from an essay by C.P. Snow. Um, and it turns out, well, in, in, in Snow's work, the humanities and the sciences are often speaking, uh, uh, talk past one another, uh, as they have different goals and different methods of, of, of scholarly work. I would argue that not all questions are necessarily better answered by the application of science, um, but that all questions are better addressed by the application of critical thinking. Um, philosophy, modern and medieval history, literature, uh, and folklore. Uh, art history, linguistics, rhetoric and writing, these are all areas of humanistic study that are represented um, by the panelists up here today. Um, and I would like to tap into this collective expertise to ask two major questions. Uh, what role does critical thinking play in the humanities? And what do the humanities have to offer skepticism? Um, and now I'd like to uh, invite, starting with Eve, uh, the panel members to uh, introduce themselves. Hi, uh, my name's Eve Siebert. I have a PhD in English literature. Um, my primary field of study was Old and Middle English literature with uh, secondary concentrations on Old Norse and Shakespeare, modern guy. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Oh, and also with Bob, I'm a co grand poobah of the uh, site skepticalhumanities.com. Visit it often. Uh, I'm Massimo Pellucci. I am in a f my former life. I was an evolutionary biologist. Uh, I am now a professor of philosophy at the City University of New York, and I produce the Rationally Speaking blog and podcast. I'm Joe Nickel. I'm a senior research fellow at the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, Free Inquiry, Ma uh, Skeptical Inquirer magazine. And uh, my background is I'm a professional stage magician, I was a detective, and I have a PhD in English literature and folklore. I'm Jenna Griffith, I'm an art historian, and um, <laughs> uh, in my research I look at how various scientific theory, especially Darwinian theory, changed the way that uh, visual presentation changed in the latter half of the 19th century, and in teaching especially I try to bring things back from the edge of postmodern literary criticism and apply more critical thinking in class. Thank you very much. Um, to start off, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Joe Nickel to read a poem. This is quite possibly a first for a skeptical conference. So. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, I, I didn't know which, which poem to bring, but I finally decided on this one. Uh, on my mother's death. <clears throat> because I think we, we skeptics are, you know, not just uh, uh, critical thinking, uh, abstruse uh, rationalists, but we are also feeling people. I'm a 
guitar player and songwriter and artist, watercolor artist, a poet, and uh, those two are not at, those two worlds are not at war with each other. Uh, it's called uh, the gift among the wildflowers, in memory of my mother Ella Turner Nickel. <clears throat> in spring, during the awakening of the earth, death came in the night for her, a last breath. Then, at the hillside graveyard, the wind carried her name among the wildflowers. I do not listen for her voice, or imagine I glimpse her face haunting the shadows. Instead, I recall through a child's eyes, her eyes, watching the child, searching in the field, reaching among the wild flowers. Um, everybody uh, at this uh, at this panel has had uh, at, at some point, or I, I imagine, uh, have encountered uh, uh, perhaps reluctance uh, on the on the part of other skeptics, or maybe have seen skeptics wander into some areas where uh, science enthusiasts wandering into areas where perhaps they were not so comfortable in the humanities. Um, I wonder if anyone here has any. Uh, Eve, do you have an example of? Do, do I have something prepared? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> <laughs> sure, OK, let's do that. <laughs> Gosh, I just seem to have something written down. She does. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, it does often seem that uh, skepticism is, you know, it's like skepticism equals science. Science equals skepticism. Um, and sometimes uh, we forget that s the rest of us we can think too, um, and we. Um, and sometimes skeptics' reverence for uh, science can even invade areas that properly belong to the humanities. So, for instance, um, earlier this year, uh, Brian Dunning devoted part of a skeptoid episode to the Shakespeare authorship controversy controversy because it's not a real one but um, and, and that is the, the idea that someone other than Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare um, and Dunning came to uh, what I consider the the correct conclusion um, quote all available evidence supports Shakespeare as a real living author and the only support for the opposing viewpoint is supposition end quote what I found off-putting though about this particular episode uh, was the sources that Dunning cited. Um, those two great uh, literary heavyweights, Scientific American and Fizzorg.com. Now, just a side note, um, I'm, a, I'm preparing a, a, a little article on string theory using Chaucer Review <laughs> and the Journal of English and Germanic Philology. I think you're really going to like it. <laughs> Uh, the Scientific American article was by uh, Michael Shermer. He was specifically addressing um, former Supreme Court Justice uh, jo uh, John Paul Stevenson's contention that the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt um, that Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, that uh, the Earl of Oxford wrote Shakespeare. Um, and Shermer says, quote, uh, reasonable doubt should not cost an author his claim, at least not if we treat history as a science instead of a legal debate, unquote. Hey, I have an idea. Why don't we treat history as history? Um, it is its own field uh, with its own methodologies and standards of uh, scholarship. It may be messier than science um, and more open to interpretation, but that's largely unavoidable. Um, it, and it can't be fixed by trying to force it into being a science. And just by the way, um, Shakespeare studies isn't a science, it's not legal debate, uh, it's not really history, although all those things can impinge on Shakespeare studies. Properly speaking, it does belong to uh, the study of English literature. Um, in introducing the phys.org.com uh, article, Dunning says, 
quote, perhaps the most compelling reason to accept Shakespeare as the real author is his unique and recognizable writing style, which does not match that of other authors, uh, uh, other authors to which his works have been attributed by doubters. And this is not merely uh, an unreliable subjective opinion. It's backed by hard science. Woohoo! Um, again, there is a suggestion that uh, the humanities are only trustworthy uh, when science is involved to back them up. Now, of course, science can be a useful tool in literary studies. Um, in this case, um, literary scholars used, and I should say literary scholars, uh, emphasize that, they use computational sty stylistics to detect Shakespeare's hand in various works. Um, for the most part, they weren't actually talking about the authorship controversy, um, although it came up. But in other words, they used a computer program to compare Shakespeare's diction, syntax, uh, use of compound words, uh, etc., typical spellings, um, and compare them to other writers of the period. So for instance, a, a scholar might look at a work whose authorship is disputed um, and use the program to compare it to works by many authors. Um, the, then the frequency with which certain typical features appear um, of a certain author uh, may suggest a likely attribution. So obviously, in, in that sort of co context, a computer program uh, is a, a very useful tool because it can go through a huge amount of data very, very quickly. Um, still, it builds on work done by literary scholars for decades. Um, you know, deciding which uh, elements of syntax diction, how compounds are formed, use of enjambment, etc., uh, what are the typical features of different poets. Um, in addition, it's wild, widely optimistic uh, to suggest that such a computer analysis will definitively um, settle almost any question, um, but much less the, the manufactured authorship controversy. Um, what ends up happening, I, I can guarantee this, is one scholar says, well, my computer program says, um, Shakespeare wrote disputed play X. Um, then another scholar says, yeah, well, my computer program says John Fletcher wrote disputed play X, for instance. Um, because, and, and that has in fact already happened, or similar things. Um, for instance, uh, in the article Dunning was citing, um, Arthur F. Kinney says, quote, I have now proven that Shakespeare is part author of Arden of Faversham, unquote. And almost immediately, uh, someone else, Sir Brian Vickers, argued based on his own computer analysis that Thomas Kidd was the sole author. So. Um, in short, science is great. Um, it can help to address certain issues that arise in the humanities, uh, but it's not magically going to fix the humanities, um, which don't necessarily need to be fixed. They work in their own way. And if you're going to address a, a certain issue in which you are not personally an expert, um, it might be a good idea to consult people who do have expertise in that field, even if they are in the humanities and not the sciences. Massimo. Sure. Uh, see, yes, I do have prepared remarks, but I will <laughs> barely look at them. So, I, I mean, the problem is what some philosophers refer to as scientism, which is, seems to, to be um, not only a common malady among scientists, but also among skeptics. And um, let, let me tell you what it is with a little anecdote. So as I said in my previous life, I was an evolutionary biologist for 25 years. I was a practice and research biologist. I, I know I don't look that old, but believe me, it was 25, it was a quarter century. And uh, so then I decided that, well, enough of this. Let me switch fields, and, and I want to do something different. Oh, philosophy sounds interesting. So I went back to graduate school, got my degree, and got a job. My original idea was, hey, I'm going to be a scientist moving to philosophy. 
and doing philosophy of science, which means philosophers are going to look at me at somebody who actually knows what he's talking about when it comes to science, because, you know, I've done the damn thing. Um, and scientists are going to actually listen to a philosopher once in a while, because, you know, I was one of them. Um, exactly the opposite happened. Uh, so for, for philosophers, I'm too much of a scientist. For scientists, I'm too much of a philosopher, so nobody listens to what I have to say. Uh, so thanks for coming here today. <laughs> the, um, uh, the problem is scientists. What, what do I mean by scientists? Science is a great thing, obviously. Uh, it does all sorts of things for us, uh, from the atomic bomb to Viagra. And so who can argue against those kinds of inventions? <laughs> it has given us you know, a much better understanding of the world, of course, that we used to have. There is a problem, however, when, when people want to uh, take a scientific, quote unquote, which I would say a scientific approach to everything. And, and we just heard some, some examples of what happens. Um, my colleague Daniel Dennett once said um, that uh, the problem with science, with, with science is that it always comes with philosophical baggage. It's just that most of that baggage, most of the time, is not actually addressed. It's not examined. Now, it isn't the scientist's job to examine that baggage. Because the scientist's job is to actually do the science. They don't have time, believe me. When you have to write a grant proposal almost every semester to get funded and get your postdocs and PhD students and so on and so forth, you don't have the time to start, stop and think about, uh, what exactly is it I'm doing? Am I using Occam's razor correctly? Don't do that. The philosophers do that. The problem comes when the scientists don't want to talk to the philosophers, and honestly, vice versa, uh, because each, each camp thinks, thinks that they have their, the, the, you know, the, the best way of, of addressing things. By the way, at 5.30, I'm going to give an entire talk on this thing just across the, the, the street here. Um, but let me give you a couple of examples. So I'm sure every skeptic here has heard Carl Sagan saying some variation of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, that is actually David Hume, a uh, Scottish philosopher of the 18th century. Now, he didn't put it that way. Um, he said that a wise person proportions uh, his beliefs to evidence, which is about the same thing. Now, Hume wrote this, this wonderful essay called On Miracles, which is really ought to be a manual for skeptical inquiry. I mean, everything you want to know, almost everything you want to know about skeptical inquiry and critical thinking is in On Miracles. Um, of course, he got in trouble for that. This was still the 18th century in Scotland, so it, the, the church authorities were not particularly keen on this thing. But um, Hume has actually been reinterpreted recently as essentially using Bayesian theory, or the equivalent of Bayesian theory, which is now all the rage in modern science, as a way of, doing, of making decisions about claims and about how to look at, at the evidence and, and what it tells us about claims. So one of the fundamental toolkits of the skeptic is in fact a fundamental tool of the critical thinker, the philosopher. Um, I, I'm sure many people here have read uh, Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. Uh, the, the interesting thing to me, or I should say the amusing thing to me about that book, is that Dawkins is largely right, uh, except that he insists in saying that, that, that he's making a scientific argument against the existence of God. He's not. He, he calls it the improbability argument, and he really is using Occam's razor. Uh, in a fairly nice and efficient way, but he's essentially using a interesting toolkit from philosophy, from from logical, uh, from logic, from critical thinking. Science really informs uh, a lot of the writings, but science itself is not actually determining the the best objections, the best part of parts of that of that book, uh, the most logically cogent. I actually have nothing to do, or very little to do, um, with science. Now, how are we going to solve this thing? Well, it, it used to be that we actually had a, an interesting, broader word uh, that came from Latin. It, 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 uh, the word is sentia. Uh, it's spelled almost exactly like science, but it actually means knowledge. And until the early part of the 20th century, sentia indicated every form of knowledge, including uh, you know, literary criticism, philosophy, uh, science, obviously the natural sciences, the social sciences. Everything that was done in a way in which you, know, you use your brain critically and you look at the evidence and you look at the claims that people are making and you judge claims according to the evidence or according to their internal logic. It also includes mathematics, of course. It includes logic itself. That is, I think, where, where the, the uh, skeptic community really is positioned. Uh, we are at the interface of all of these disciplines. 
Uh, it's not a question like, unfortunately, Michael uh, Schirmer keeps insisting of, of making history into a science. Uh, and it's not a way of redoing, you know, reducing the social sciences to biology, as my colleague E.O. Wilson uh, insists in saying. It's a matter of getting all of these things together and exchange the tools that are actually common to all of these disciplines. And see as, uh, uh, how much one discipline can learn can import from the other while retaining their own methods, their own approaches, their own problems. Because frankly, a lot of scientists don't actually read literature, so they're really awful literary critics. They don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they don't really read a lot of history either. So when they start talking about history, they really don't make much sense. It's not because you have a PhD in the sciences uh, in, uh, in your, on your CV, all of a sudden you can um, you become um, an expert on everything. And just, let's just remember that Dwayne Gish one of the most prominent creationists of all time has a PhD in the sciences, okay? And so does Michael Behe, the mo one of the most prominent intelligent design proponents. So having a PhD in science, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you're not talking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> that is true also for philosophers, by the way. <laughs> I know plenty of those. Uh, it's it's not a matter. Of, in other words, a PhD. It's neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for avoiding talking <coughs> nonsense. Uh, it does help um, uh, because it teach, it gives you some minimum standards of, of reasoning and evidence. So what I think that the these, the skeptic community can actually do, because it is a community that really. Uh, is not made up for the, major for the majority of professionals, uh, although several professionals are interested in the skeptic movement. This is, it's, it's made of people who really genuinely want to learn and want to think uh, critically about the world, and they interface with the general public. Scientists themselves and philosophers themselves, I'm sure the same is true for literary critics and historians, have a hard time interacting with the, with the public directly. They don't know how to do it. Uh, you know, when, when you're hired as a, as a scholar in a university, the first thing that they do, of course, is they put you in front of a classroom. They don't really teach you how to teach. They just assume that because you know something about, I don't know, Kant or Shakespeare, therefore you know how to teach Kant or Shakespeare. The two absolutely do not follow. They're completely different sets of skills. What does uh, fall and what, what our community can do on the other hand is that this is made of people, it's a community made of people who are interested in talking to non-scholars, but they're also interested in talking to the scholars, so it's an ideal interface. If we just uh, take seriously the idea that skepticism is therefore all pervasive, it's uh, intrinsically interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary, I think we can do a lot both to help the scholars themselves and frankly for the general public. Thank you. Uh Dr. Nickel. And what's the question? Uh, <laughs> um, how have you used um, you, the skill set you had in your literary studies? Uh, how does that translate to your, your current career? Yeah, I use it all the time. Uh, I, I agree with Massimo. I think we, we need to make the best use of all the disciplines that we, that we have. I am as interested in using blood pattern analysis uh, which I used to solve the mystery of the Atlanta House of Blood uh, and to show that it was a hoax because the blood was not oozing out of the walls but had been flung onto the wall and blood pattern analysis showed that and showed, gave a lie to the claims of the people. I'm also uh, using, uh, for example, in um, looking at some mis mysterious disappearance stories, uh, I found taking a classic one of those stories that by doing a literary study, I found that, first of all, using historical techniques, that there was no such family that, that the story centered around. There was no record of any such family or any such story. And eventually found that it was a, the story, which is in many of the books of strange and unexplained mysteries, had actually been plagiarized from an Ambrose Bierce short story. <laughs> And that was not science doing that. That was really literary, literary studies that was doing that for me, and, and historical studies. Um, I went on to be interested, as Bob knows, in, in the mystery of Ambrose Bierce's own strange disappearance, which, until I did my, my master's degree in this, uh, had been generally settled as that Ambrose Bierce died in Mexico, either fighting for Pancho Villa or or Carranza on one side or the other, and there were all these folk tales, uh, which uh, by doing folkloristic analysis I knew were, were pretty much like Elvis Presley sightings. 
and there's no science to, to really apply because uh, we didn't have Beers's body. But I began looking at the kinds of things that, that a historian would look at, and I found that before he disappeared, uh, Beers had uh, talked about disappearing. Um, he had um, talked uh, in a suicidal way. He had, in fact, written a powerful essay about called On Taking Oneself Off, uh, advocating that when you get old, as he was, and tired, that you take the soldier's way out and you commit suicide. People said, oh, Beers wasn't the kind of guy that, that would uh, have committed suicide. So have you ever read his essay? He absolutely powerfully advocates it. He wrote letters to friends saying uh, things like, this is to say goodbye at the end of a long friendship, and my work is finished, and so am I. And he showed a friend a, a picture of a place in the canyon of the Colorado where he said, they'll never find my bones. He had a German pistol, which he talked about using for the purpose. This was all denied for, for decades by Encyclopedia Britannica and everyone else. I was shocked to find out how much evidence there was. He had closed out his, not only his address, but his post office uh, receipt of mail had closed it permanently out. He wrote a letter to his daughter, Laura, and he said of the cemetery plot where he was expected to lie, he said, and I quote you, I do not wish to lie there. That matter is all arranged. And you will not be bothered by the mortal part of, and it was signed, your daddy. Beers promised they'll never find my bones, and of course, we never have. But we don't need DNA analysis to tell us that Ambrose Beers disappeared because he was a tired old man who said my work is finished and so am I and who talked about suicide and who left us a trail that we critical thinkers can follow quite clearly and commonsensically and I would say using Occam's razor to see exactly he took himself off. So I'm using, I'm applying uh, whatever techniques I can uh, techniques of science or history or or anything else to try to solve strange mysteries and uh, the, whatever the best tool is, I, I hope to use it. Um, Jenna, um, in your discipline, um, how does critical thinking, how do the, the, the skill set we normally associate with, with skepticism, how does it apply to, to art history? Um, and also, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about aesthetics, too, if that's, you know. Uh, to give a, you put me on stage with a philosopher and you want me to talk about aesthetics? Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, Lord. you got, sure, sure, yeah. Don't worry, I'm a philosopher of science, so it's pretty, oh, it's pretty yeah, yeah, It's totally different. They have nothing to do with one another. But I can talk about it. <laughs> yeah. um, what I would say is that as an art historian, you have to be a very strong critical thinker and that there is a lot of information that could play into an analysis of a single work of art that could be dubious to say the least. And as a critical thinker, you need to be able to ask questions that uh, could lead you down the path to find a richer analysis of a work to find out some underlying information that is not necessarily presented when you immediately look at a work and have that aesthetic response. Um, coming at it from a slightly different way, I've encountered a lot of people who are um, self-described skeptics who, when I tell them I'm an art historian, their first response to me is, oh, I don't get art. <laughs> Which is actually very similar to the response that I get from a lot of my students who have signed up for the art history class because they think they're going to see a lot of pretty pictures and it'll be an easy A. Um, that would be a yes on the first notion and a no on the second notion. Because there is a lot of rigor in art history. It's not just looking at pretty pictures. Uh, you have to be able to synthesize history, theology, anthropology, gender studies, psychology, literature, um, 
when you look at a work of art and your response to it is, I don't get it, that is not the artist's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Much like if you um, pick up Darwin's origin, you know, book, thick, lots of words there, and you don't get it within the first couple pages, it's probably not Darwin's fault. There is a lot of rigor there, and it's, it's important to ask questions when you're looking at it. You want to ask things like, where was it made? When was it made? Who made it? Who was around them when they made it? What sort of influences were happening around them at the time? These are questions to ask. The, the work of art is a visual object, which you could have a very strong aesthetic response to it, that might draw you into it initially, but it's a textual object as well. It's a starting point, much like in analyzing a poem, the poem is your starting point, a work of art will be the same way. And yes, there are a lot of pretty pictures. A lot of them, nude pictures, which is, you know, draws a lot of people in, but there's a lot more than that. So just because you don't get it, that, that's not a failure of the artist. One of the, uh areas I, I work in, in is rhetoric, um, uh, persuasion. Um, and, uh, you know, when I teach freshman writing classes, uh, one of the, the topics that we, we cover every semester, we talk about the logical fallacies at, at some length, um, which are absolutely crucial part of, of any uh, skeptical uh, toolbox. Um, and when, when I think about, in, in terms of communicating the message of, uh, you know, of, of skepticism and, and, and critical thinking, uh, you look at um, people like the, the, the Mythbusters or, you know, uh, Phil Plate, um, his uh, Don't Be a Dick speech was all about ethos, you know, it was, it was about the, uh, how do you convey personal uh, how do you present yourself in a way that conveys some sort of uh, authority in order to persuade people um, to at least think about your position? Um, and I, I, I wonder, like, what do you folks see as being the the, uh, the role of the of the humanities in shaping skepticism down the road? You know, uh, the message of skepticism. Anyone? Yeah, I can I can start by telling you a little story. Uh, a few years ago, so I was I lived nearby, not in Atlanta, but in Knoxville, Tennessee, for nine years. I called that my purgatory. <laughs> and uh, so one one day, we invite the local skeptic group um, invites Michael Shermer down for a talk, and so the two of us appear on a local radio um, talk sh to, you know talk show. And um, the first thing the, the host the, so, the host chats with us for a few minutes before the show. The first thing he says on the air, he says, I'm absolutely stunned. I just spent several mi minutes with two skeptics, and they were both, laugh both laughing and being so congenial. And I said, <laughs> as opposed to what? Um, I said, well, you know, cynics uh, are really bad, sour sourly people that, um, that have, you know, they, they, they always say no, no, no. I said, first of all, there's a difference between a skeptic and a cynic. And second of all, where did you get these ideas? That the problem, but that is in fact a fairly um, common understanding of what skepticism is. Um, in uh, New York City Skeptics, with, of, uh, on, I'm, I'm on their member uh, uh, board uh, in uh, in the city, and there's this constant discussions about probably we shouldn't be using the word skepticism because you know every time you mention skeptic to somebody, people react like, oh, you're the ones that don't believe in anything, and then you have the ones that say, always say no about things. I think the first order of business is really to re take back the word skeptic and make it into, into, into something that is, that is actually um, positive. Um, the other thing that came to mind when you were um, talking about there, uh, now I lost it. Oh yes. So one of the things you can you can do uh, to both introduce people and in fact my my students in a more positive way to we just heard mention of logical fallacies. Uh, to most people, if you start mentioning logic, the eyes just glaze over and say, "Wake me up when you're done with this." And then if you start talking about the difference between formal fallacies and informal fallacies and all that, it's just you lost people. Except you can actually do it in a completely different way. So, for instance, one of the things that I do with my students, and I teach a critical thinking course, and we play a game. It's called spot the logical fallacy. 
And so I showed them a clip of five minutes of you know, CNN or ABC News or Fox News I don't show because it's too easy. <laughs> I mean, I give them extra points, but I don't want to just give, out, give away the points. <laughs> And uh, the, the game consists in, you know, whoever spots the first logical fallacy and can actually name it uh, gets, you know, five points, the second one, four points, the third one, three points, and so on. To my own astonishment, you can actually watch five minutes of evening news and spot up to eight or ten logical fallacies. This is, this is, think about it. I mean, that's one every 30 seconds. That's, that's really an astounding, um, an astounding statistics. But you can, that's, that's one of the things you can do. In, in, you know, make it into... Um, Look, guys, this is something you can actually learn uh, while enjoying yourself because it is an enjoyable thing. And once you once you can, um, um, you know, sell to your to, to your friends or to your students, in my case, the idea that a course in critical thinking is really a course in bullshit detection. <laughs> uh, who wants to be bullshitted? Nobody wants to. So, okay, here I am. I'm going to teach you how to reduce the chances that uh, somebody's going to take advantage of you. I think that's that's one way to go about it. Uh, one of the the things that I've I've noticed in the area I've trained in uh, literary studies is that there seems to be perception there's a lot of bullshit going on in there <laughs> um, you laugh oh man um, but um, I wonder if uh, Eve uh, what do you think about the perception of something like literary studies what are the, the, the practical applications of, of literary studies or should we be looking towards practicality well, first of all, I, I was going to say uh, another thing for teaching fallacies oh, okay. is uh, Monty Python's "How to Smell a, or tell, How to Tell a Witch," mm -hmm. because uh, just <laughs> beautiful for uh, deductive reasoning that works oddly. And <laughs> what was your question? I forget, <laughs> but you know, that, uh, literary, literary studies. studies. The, oh, the, and and what's the use of them? <laughs> Go well, the for reputation it, yeah. that they have. The reputation that they have. Yeah. Um, well, I know, uh, well, in general, some people just think they're floofy. Um, uh, but also, uh, and I think this is something you want to talk about more because it's your area of things that you're concerned about because you're talking about theory. Okay. <laughs> but Go for it. You really want me to, to dive into that? Because, I, yeah, all right, guys. Sure, dive. Come you're going to get a lesson. No. Um, <laughs> no. Um, one of the, 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 the interesting characteristics of uh, literary theory, um, you go into a class uh, on, let's say, uh, women writers of the 20th century in America, um, and you, it's, it seems that like the humanities have, have they come with a sort of politically charged uh, motivation, that people are always looking for symbols of oppression and you know, trying to unlock the you know, um, and the way that people go about it, it you have a, a massive amount of basically data, and then you go looking for those little bits within the massive amount of data that that prove exactly the point, Alleluia, that you're trying to make. It's like the Bible code. Yeah, well, it really, I mean, totally. It, it, it feels like a lot like it very often, and I think that the humanities have a, uh, the people who really believe that are very loud. Um, and I think they kind of give the humanities a bad name. There is, in fact, rigor there. Um, uh, have you come across anything like that in, in your area? You, you, Jenna, either well, one? Well, that, I often say that I kind of I traverse the divide between pure empiricism and so-called lit crit, postmodern critical theory, stuff like that. And, and as you said, there is a very bad reputation for what somebody who is into literary studies does. There, there's rigor there. It's, it tends to be very focused depending on what area of literary studies they're in. Um, it can be done extremely badly, but the people that do it badly are the people that don't actually survive in the field that long. Because when you're in an academic setting, it's very cutthroat. And if somebody thinks you've done shoddy work, they will call you out on it. They will write a paper saying exactly why you are as stupid as you are. Yes. And they will lay out every single reason in 18 different languages why you are as stupid as you are. So it, there's a self-correcting feature there, much like in a uh, 
you know, peer-reviewed scientific study. Somebody is going to come back with a paper to refute your evidence, refute your results. The same thing is going to happen on the uh, humanity side. May, may I actually disagree slightly on that? Okay. Not in your field because I don't, I don't know it, but, but in uh, both philosophy and frankly in the sciences, I actually know a hell of a lot of people who keep having entire careers are bullshitting other people. Um, and nobody, get, nobody catch, catches them for two different reasons. In, uh, they work differently in the philosophy and in, and in science. In science, you're right. If you make major claims, they're obviously empirically verifiable. You know, if you say that you actually found empirical evidence that supports string theory, Somebody's going to check it. <laughs> but if you study, you know, yet another population of another species of tropical butterflies that really nobody gives a damn about, and you're the only one in the world that actually goes down there and spends time with them, literally, you can make up data. Uh, I don't know people actually have made up data, but I, I know of people that, that publish very shoddy, very, very you know, irrelevant, inconsequential papers. They get published in second, third, fourth rate journals. Uh, they stay forever. Nobody ever rebuts them. Nobody ever does anything because they're just, you know. Uh, imagine this. Uh, an interesting statistic that came out a few years ago is that one third of all scientific papers published on top journals are never cited once. In other words, one third of all the top science papers are useless. Okay? Nobody reads them, nobody follows up. Imagine the ones that are not top journals. And philosophy works differently. Yeah, I heard the word postmodernism earlier. Um, so there is entire branches of philosophy that are, shall we say, questionable. Uh, in terms of you know sort of internal logic or what it is exactly these people are saying. I mean, I'm, I'm, I tried. I read some of this stuff, and I can make um, you know head for, from tail in some of these things. But once they get, to, the people get to create a sub-community within a, the, the academy, uh, then they keep going for decades. Uh, and nobody seems to be uh, particularly bothered by it. Or if they're bothered, they don't do anything about it. So there is actually quite a bit more, um, you know, less rigorous stuff that goes on even in academia than, uh, than outside. That's why I said earlier that a PhD is not a guarantee of anything, pretty much. That said, you know, you are, you are under more heavy fire. If you come under fire, you are under more heavy fire, I think, under those uh, in, in the academy than, than outside because the stakes are tiny. In academics, fights are inversely proportional to the stakes. So the less it matters, the more they get upset about what they do. I noticed a lot in, uh, in English literature and literary studies that um, a lot of literary scholars who, who are quite intelligent, but they didn't seem to have, for example, they were not using Occam's razor a lot. So they would get an idea, some kind of just impressionistic idea in literature, and then make a case for it. But that's not, you know, you don't start with the answer and, and work backward to the evidence. You should be looking for the best evidence and then prioritizing it, sorting out false leads and so forth. I'll mention a case that I did, another case other than Ambrose Bierce, but, uh, but I remember when I did the Bierce, one of my professors saying uh, at the um, oral exams for my master's uh, thesis, he looked at me rather astonished and said, it's, I'm surprised that over all these decades, you're only the second person ever to, to look into this. And the other was... Uh, Vincent Starrett, who was uh, Bierce's friend, who tried to tell people and no one would listen to him. And people were saying things like, well, Bierce just wasn't the kind of guy to commit suicide. When it was just, so they didn't look. And if you had evidence, they would just dismiss it. But to mention one other case that I did, which was uh, there's a, in colonial American literature, there's a, a satiric writing by Ebenezer Cook called the Sotweed Factor. As a satire, and uh, we have the first edition of it, and we have the third edition of it, and no one had ever found a single copy of the lost edition of the Sodweed Factor, considered one of the great mysteries of colonial American literature. And so <laughs> I was, I went for that, you see, because I'd been a detective, and when I came back later in life to English literature, I wanted to do detective work. I wanted to solve mysteries. And I was a different kind of thinker than many of my professors, I tell you. But I went up after class to Professor Shawcross, and I said, you know about the, the missing 
addition of the sotweed factor? And he said, yes, yes. And I said, well, I think I've found it. And he gave me one of those looks, like, I'll bet you found something. <laughs> and uh, and he, was, he was always very sympathetic to my way of thinking and so forth. But what it, what it amounted to was I realized that between Cook's first edition and third edition, he had published what everybody had always regarded as a sequel called Sotweed Redivivus. But think about it. It means Sotweed revived. Or I was thinking it could mean Sotweed reissued. What if instead of considering that a sequel, we just counted that as one, two, three? So I immediately I had, would you say, a, a hypothesis, possible explanation. So I pursued that, and I found that Cook had actually left notes in his own handwriting on the flyleaf of a page, and it was called Notes for a Preface to the Second Edition. And I just compared those to the preface for Sotweed Redivivus. And lo, an entire missing edition was found not to have been missing after all. <laughs> and so it's just, you know, I was just bringing a different kind of, of mindset to the world of English literature. And I think more of that kind of use of logic and asking ourselves, does this really meet the test of Occam's razor, which is a very good test to apply, say, to Shakespeare? I've taught Shakespeare, and you know, when, when these guys say, well, maybe Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, you, you say, well, his contemporaries thought he did, and there are all these additions. Why are we supposed, rather than me have to prove he did, why do you think he didn't? And then you get into these bizarre people who have found secret messages in Shakespeare's texts <laughs> and this Bible code stuff uh, long before the Bible code the Baconians were finding biliteral ciphers in Shakespeare's text go back and look at the history of the people who were telling you be long before the Oxfordians um, well they were, they were not using evidence the way a critical thinker would use forget science but I mean we share the humanities can share um, a desire to solve mysteries the humanities can share tools like logic and evidence and I mean even DNA evidence could theoretically be used in some liter literary cases uh, but certainly things like uh, Occam's razor so. uh, 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 GDA rhyme scheme perhaps in poetry well maybe I wouldn't go that far yeah okay I, I thought I'd try Humor it clearly didn't work. <laughs> Do you want some? Where was that joke sign? Yeah, a joke. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. See. No. Wait. <laughs> I hate you. They all. laughed. You know. <laughs> they laughed, but maybe for different reasons. Yeah. Now you They're got laughing the laugh. at you, not with you. Yeah. Don't worry. I'll take what I can get <laughs> at this point. You know, I think Bob always wanted to be a stand-up comic, but the audience kept saying. Sit down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but what about? Um, you know, we, there's something ab about. Uh, we had a question. Oh, do, a do, question. do we have questions? Yeah. See. We have time. Yeah, for we got a ten minutes. Why don't we take questions? Cool. That'd be great. Sure. Yeah. So if you could step up to the mic if it's on. Yeah. When you are talking about postmodernism, it brought to mind the article by Alan Sokol or Sokal, uh, which at least one of you is familiar with. And that's kind of like the paradigm. It takes a scientist to come in and put these wishy-washy, you know, postmodernists in their place. So I was just, you know, wondering, you know, want any comments you have on that? And also, I mean, can you do something? Uh, this may be something that can only happen once in a lifetime due to its nature, but it seems like there could be some more of that kind of thing coming from the humanities so you know what do you think of it from a humanities background and is it something that people should be aspiring to do as a model yeah. i'd be very um careful about the Sokol affair in fact Sokol himself is favor is careful about drawing conclusions so i don't know how probably many people are familiar with it but this is a, he's a physicist at nyu who had few several years ago wrote a completely fake paper on the hermeneutics of quantum mechanics and submitted it to Social Text, which is a postmodern journal. And the editors saw this thing, they, they accepted it for publication, and then Sokol wrote an expose in a, a magazine for academic affairs that doesn't exist anymore called Lingua Franca, 
where he said, hey, this was entirely made up. It made absolutely no sense, but these people thought it was the best thing they had come across. Um, and, and he showed that the editors were careless, that they were after ideological uh, positions because they, they, they saw this paper coming from a physicist and they say, here we go, we have a physicist who actually embraces postmodernism, so let's publish it. But Sokol himself wrote a book about, of course, this thing later in, in an essay in a collection about uh, postmodernism and the sciences, the so-called culture wars, or science wars. And um, he, he himself was pretty careful and said, look, all, all that shows is those editors were very careless, that they, were, they had uh, ideological motives and so on and so forth. The problem with that kind of trick is this. It makes for a great publicity stunt, obviously, and, it, and the point comes across very clearly. Uh, but then you need to be careful because the, the favor can be returned. Um, and, uh, and I guarantee you, it's, that's postmodernists, postmodernists don't know enough about science to do that. But if I wanted to do something like the Sokol Affair with a biology journal, I could definitely do it. Uh, it's not a big deal. You would get, you know, I'm, I'm an editor of a, of, a, of a professional journal. I know it's very difficult to spot fakery uh, in certain areas of science because people can literally make up uh, data. And the the... Uh, assumption usually in academic journals is that the, the author is not trying to trick you. What what the referees look for uh, are technical flaws. You know, there are things you know, bad reasoning, that sort of stuff. Which of course the editors of uh, of social text should have caught. But but it is actually if the guy actually is out to get you, he will be able to get you in pretty much every field at least at, at least for a while. Um, but that was at the height of the of the sort of science wars, and. Um, we're still in it. I'm editing now a book on the, um, for the University of Chicago Press on the philosophy of pseudoscience, and I have invited two sociologists of science. And by golly, they try to pull this postmodern stuff on me again, and we're, now we're having fights. <laughs> so, yeah. But And also, I mean, social text was not peer-reviewed, am That's I right? That's correct. And, and so, you know, most literary journals are peer-reviewed, so he chose one that was not peer-reviewed. Um, right. and, and which makes hoaxing kind of easier. And the other thing is, is there is a certain amount of, okay, there is a certain amount of silliness and the ridiculous ideology and uh, insane use of language, um, uh, you know, so that it's impossible to understand what the author is actually trying to say, which proves that language deconstructs itself into meaninglessness, apparently. <laughs> but, um, the, but, 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 that it, it's become kind of a stereotype that I think <laughs> we're sometimes beaten with, um, that that all literary uh, uh, analysis or, or all literary studies is like that. Um, and there's a certain amount of that, um, but it's not all like that. So, and not even all theory is, is quite like that. Another question? Um, much of the sort of skeptical toolkit, if you will, seems predicated on the idea that whatever question you're examining has a falsifiable answer. And a lot of what y'all have mentioned this afternoon, um, Ambrose Bierce either did kill himself or he didn't. Shakespeare either wrote his works or he didn't. Those are falsifiable questions. But in a lot of the humanities and in a lot of criticism in particular, you're asking, ontological and even solipsistic questions that may not be answerable in that sense. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on how you go and apply the skeptical toolkit to questions for which it was expressly not designed. That's my question. Well, certainly, uh, as I did in the case of uh, Ambrose Bierce, you can, you can certainly uh, bring in a, a huge amount of evidence that the man committed suicide because he said he was going to commit suicide. He talked about disappearing. He uh, left farewell uh, letters. He closed out his affairs and so forth. And so the, the preponderance of evidence it is, is simply there. And you can, you, you can prioritize scenarios by using Occam's razor. The, 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 the people who were saying that beers uh, didn't commit suicide were creating elaborate scenarios of him hooking up with, for example, with uh, fighting with Pancho Villa, whom he despised, or, you know, and the State Department didn't even have any information that he had crossed the border into Mexico, and so on. So I think you can, you can put together a preponderance of evidence. Obviously, in, in literary studies, you won't use the highest standard 
of, of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that you would use in court. But you certainly can can um, dismiss. Uh, I apologize for, for cutting you off, but I may have m not communicated my question effectively. Okay. There are questions one asks in criticism about what are the meanings of these You're talking words. Talking about like literary analysis. Yes, right? I'm, or I'm artistic I'm, analysis. Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. I think I know where you're going. <clears throat> um, as somebody who is a critical thinker, a skeptic, they're looking for empiricism. Is this where you're kind of headed? They're looking for empiricism, and when there is not something that can be completely, you know, falsifiable, as it were, right, wrong, that sort of thing, where do we apply? Is that where you're going? Well, if I could give an example, um, my degree is in film theory. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of writing, especially the dawn of film theory, um, by Zine and uh, and Eisenstein. Both wrote about this fairly extensively about what is the nature of cinema. And there's this whole argument about mise en scene versus montage and whatnot. And it's sort of agreed upon to be one of those infinitely, infinitely unpackable, but never really answerable questions. And that's right. the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm right. talking about the construction of meaning as opposed to finding an answer to a question that does have a yes or no But look, if we're talking yes no about um, unpackable, infinitely unpackable questions, you know, philosophy is right there. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we're all about the questions and not about the answers. But, but the thing I think, the way, one way to think about what you're talking about, that is these kinds of questions that do not have definite answers or for which it doesn't make any sense to even talk about falsifiability, um, is that you can still use critical analysis, you can still use logic, because the way I see it, for instance, in philosophy, is, is this. There may not be a right answer to the question of, you know, what is ethics and, and what is right and wrong, but there certainly are a lot of wrong answers. Yeah. Okay. I, I and have so to the, explain right? that to so the students job, in, in literary yeah. classes. So the yeah. job of the philosopher, or, and I imagine the literary critic and so on, is to explore the logical space of possibility and start saying, no, that doesn't work, no, that doesn't work, no, that doesn't work. You might not get to the end where only one thing works, but don't, don't forget that that is often the case also in science. One of the things that a lot of scientists are mm, seem to be unaware of, because again, they don't study philosophy, they shouldn't, that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, it's called the underdetermination of theory by the data. Uh, it is a fairly well understood thing in philosophy of science that every theory um, uh, is never, in fact, tested uniquely by even an infinite uh, data set. There, there's, there's too many theories that are compatible with the data as we have them. And that will always be the case. So, which means that you cannot actually technically falsify anything. You can only say, well, the best bet, given the current evidence, you can do what Joe was doing in his analysis. Uh, that's called inference to the best explanation. You can say, look, in logical space, in triangulation in log logical space, if I look at the arguments here and the evidence over there, this is my best bet. You're not, you can never say this is the thing, not even in science, let alone in, in these other disciplines. I would say also in, in the, the arts and literature, um, you know, if you're trying to come up with the answer for Hamlet or the answer for The Last Supper. Yes, um, he's crazy. <laughs> well, you're not going to get it. And the thing is, if you have a literary work that, you know, just it, it's obvious what exactly it means in every possible way, that would be dull. And no one would yeah. be interested in it when we wouldn't be discussing it. That's kind of what makes the humanities you interesting, the arts interesting, is that there, the there are many uh, possible interpretations. But you still have to marshal your evidence to explain your interpretation and why your interpretation is valid. Yeah, the process is important, not just not just an in some end point. Mm -hmm. But um, I like to say of of uh, use of metaphor Speaking in, of in uh, poems <laughs> and so forth that a, a lot of times what you're trying to do is is not have a specific meaning but have a resonancy. It's it's resonant with meaning. It's 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 giving off possibilities that cause the reader to to think about the possible meanings. And that seems to be what we have time for. I want to thank the panelists. Thank you very much. This was a great...